Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the WXYZ Thanks. Sports Lunch, rebooting this as 2016's final here. I'm your host, Justin Rose. Each and every Monday, we'll be getting together, talking a little bit about the sports in Detroit, of course. Not, uh, not uh, lacking, certainly, any sports this wonderful, wonderful Monday morning. Afternoon, I guess it's 1230. I've been running around like crazy. John Beeline interview today will be at 6 o'clock. We'll talk about him, uh, his team's big win over per Penn State this weekend and leading up to Purdue this week. we got to talk about Michigan State football. we got to talk about Michigan football. And i got to dispel some of the rumor that I started, if you will, uh, about Chip Kelly to the Detroit Lions late last night on the social media airwaves. So we'll get to all those things, but we want to let you know how you can get involved in the show as well. You can email us. You can tweet us. Uh, you can make a comment underneath the, uh, the story title at WXYZ.com. Max White, he's here. Hey, Hello. Max. Hello, What's Justin. Up, dude? It's good to be back. Good to be back. Had man. a few a weeks while. off. Uh, it, was yeah. big, it was a big weekend in sports today. Yeah. Or this uh, weekend, I'm sorry. I would say so. I mean, the bowl season t uh, finally wrapped up. And, you know, here we are talking now about the future of the Lions. And the future of Michigan, Michigan State, as far as the football programs, because it seems like the general thought process in the world right now, at least in Metro Detroit, is that Michigan is back and Michigan State is never going to win another football game. That's the, that's the general thought, thought process. I would say so, yes. It's, it couldn't uh, be farther from the truth. Yeah, yeah, it so couldn't be. It's fun. I mean, it's, but you know what, and we've talked about this multiple times throughout the entire college football season. I mean, the fact that the rivalry is going to be back in full force and you have Michigan fans rooting for yep. Alabama. I didn't understand the Michigan fans rooting for Michigan State. Yeah. I just, you know. Well, I'd like, I'd like to hear definitely more from people out there who are watching right now um, about whether or not, if you're a Michigan fan, were you rooting for Michigan State to lose that much? Did it mean more to you than Michigan's big win on New Year's Day over Florida? Because that's the sentiment that I feel like most Michigan fans were happy that their team went out and won, but they were more excited that Michigan State had a face plan. I mean, that's what it was. Yeah. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit up here and defend Michigan State uh, in the game. However, I will defend the program because of where it is in an elite level. And here's why. It's very simple. In basketball, we all celebrate a Final Four. A mm -hmm. birth in the Final Four is something to be cherished. Banners go up for it, and it's an accomplishment that if you can do it, you are forever remembered. I'll never forget my second year in the business, West Virginia made its run in the 2010 Final Four. By the way, Michigan State was already there, also there. Just wanted to point that <laughs> out. But West Virginia made its first run to an NCAA Final Four in like 60-some years. Not since they had Pistol Pete. So, I mean, th th that in the city, in the town, was elated with this, with this Final Four run, and they got there, and then they got beat in the first round by Duke, uh, and they haven't been back since. So, getting to a Final Four is an accomplishment in basketball. The banner was raised in Morgantown. People were celebrating it, and it's still something that people look back and be like, West Virginia was there. They made that. They well, made that Final Four, and even a, though they lost. It's an accomplishment in football as well. And, and those who say Michigan State is not an elite program, I'm sorry, you're just you're completely wrong. I mean, you're looking at your stats here, right? D'Antonio, in his five full seasons as a coach, is you know has three seasons with two losses, or two seasons with two losses, a season with one loss, and a season with three losses. Mm -hmm. That's elite. Yeah. Now nationally and I think even locally they get forgotten about as being elite and they're not talked about as being elite right you know can because I don't think they have won that national championship that in Alabama has won or that possibly in LSU or Auburn has won but they are an elite program without yeah. a national championship and you're gonna I mean they have a national championship they have five of them from back of the day I'm t yeah I'm, I mean but recent now, recent yeah, yeah yeah well I mean Baylor doesn't have a national championship and people think that they're elite um, I wouldn't consider Baylor elite. Why? They've won a lot of football games over the last five, six years. They have, but I don't think they're playing to teams on the levels that Michigan State's playing. Well, yes and no. But, all right, we got a call coming in here. Dr. Sweetak, he went to the Cotton Bowl. 
and he said it was sad. Doctor, give me the news. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, my friend. Your casts, and we just, uh, I I was at that Cotton Bowl game. It was kind of disheartening, and it broke our hearts to lose. You know, I would expect, I guess our buddy Connor just didn't have his mojo. Um, Somehow I would have expected for us to at least get two touchdowns. It was very, very hard to take. Um, what was very interesting over at the Cotton Bowl, you know, we went over there, we flew in, and, I mean, green and white was everywhere. They were in the airport, restaurants, our tailgate. We saw no Alabama. It was very not well represented out there. We get in the stadium, and more than half of the stadium had the crimson red. It amazed us. Mm-hmm. Those guys really did a rough job on us. And, they were obviously a better team. Well, there's no, there's no question that Alabama sits at the head of the big boy table in college football. When that, we've known that since Nick Saban took over. I mean, he's playing for his fourth national championship in the last seven years. Think about that and for they're, a they're, second. They're the only team that's been to the college football playoff twice. Right. And Alabama is going to continue. That, that is the, the, and Michigan State even admitted to this. I, I'm sure you're, as a state fan, have kind of read some of the things about them. Michigan State... Mark D'Antonio admitted as much as we model our program after Alabama. What they have done, what, how they have done it, is the way that other teams, it's, it's the, the quintessential success program in college football. So it's, it is funny, because I do agree with you, uh, Doctor, about uh, the green and white, because it was everywhere in the tailgates, it was everywhere in the hotels, it was everywhere. The Battle of the Bands thing the day before the game, I mean, there was two two rows deep of Alabama fans around their band, and it was about seven rows deep behind the Michigan State fans. So the fanfare was there. The excitement was there. I mean, Michigan State showed out for it. Uh, yeah. But, but it, it definitely it did have a feel. I think Michigan State fans were louder in, this, in the game, but the, Michigan State didn't really give them a lot to cheer about, yeah. which you could probably admit when Connor Cook threw that interception at the end of the half, that was oh. the backbreaker. I we mean, the, the punt oh, return was the worst. Heard. We just we almost got breathless after that. Mm-hmm. One of your other issue you were talking about, I had no problems when Michigan State plays with U of M. I favor the Spartan. I bleed green. My problem is, why would you cheer for another uh, somebody not from Michigan? And these guys have to stop doing that. It's like we're bringing funds and recognition to the state. If mm-hmm. Michigan State wins or U of M wins, that's great. I would prefer Michigan State being victorious over everybody. I should also say we hit a milestone at this Cotton Bowl. This was the second Cotton Bowl that Michigan State played in in one year. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Michigan State, and I'll answer your first question, first of all. Michigan fans will never root for Michigan State to have success on the football field because it, it, it's, they just, well, Michigan State got to the college football playoff before them and that will forever grind their gears. Well, and, and another reason why as a Michigan fan, it's just, you know, you have to live with them and among them. So, you know what I'm saying? So and you're, you're a Michigan fan, yeah, so you can speak to this. So, I, you know, I live next to a Michigan State fan. You know, your neighbors are Michigan State fans sure. now. And, you know, if Michigan State goes on and wins the, the college football playoff, now, it's great for Michigan State, but it doesn't really do anything for the state of Michigan, especially because as a Michigan fan, you know, you're going to be living next to your neighbor who's going to be shouting every day of the week. You know, hey, hey remember when we won the national championship? Well, I still year? hear about we, that. We've got Michigan. that on the other side. Yeah, uh, I, one no, of, no, our, I, it one of on our mixed marriages, uh, the uh, gentleman is really strong Wolverine, and it's like... He doesn't fit in our group. <laughs> no, and, and I, I, it's, it's the same for Michigan fans, and that's why I would never expect Michigan State fans to root for Michigan because the Michigan fans would do the same thing. And you don't want to live with that. You don't want to do it, so deal what makes, with that. Doctor, thanks for the call. I really do appreciate it. But that's what makes this rivalry so sweet. And can I think I, you can agree. Can I also comment? Sure. You know, as soon as we lost that game I, on my app, and I love your Channel 7 app. I love that uh, weather and everything. It said... Alabama clobbers Michigan. You guys, it, it seems like you guys hold us in a second 
great okay, well, bad but term. You, okay, how would you, I told you that right, last time. Last time me, I talked doc, to you. Doc, 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 what would you have described it as? It was probably a clobbering, but um, <laughs> it didn't have <laughs> to make it. It the great. You didn't have to shove it in her feet. Hey, yeah, hey, look, <laughs> that was hurt, adding insult to injury. Right <laughs> afterwards, but if you can look at me uh, five days after the game and say, yeah, it was a clobbering, I don't think that the person who did it was trying to intentionally incite the riot that was already going on inside of your heart. But I appreciate the call. Hopefully we'll hear from you again soon. Okay, man? Appreciate the help. Happy New Year, and uh, keep up the good work. Let's look at Michigan State as not the little brother, but as an equal. I Thank agree you. with you. I agree with you, Doctor. Have a good day, my friend. Well, yeah, no, he makes a lot of good points. And, 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 and a, rational, a rational Michigan State fan, nonetheless. Uh, appreciate the call. If you want to get involved, phone lines are open, 248 356-0077-248-356-0077. Michigan State did get clobbered in that game. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I don't even want to really go back and go through every single play. And, like, they couldn't get down off the field on third down, and they had an opportunity, multiple. They had about six or seven opportunities to get Jake Coker on the ground in the backfield. He evaded all of the rush. He looked like Marcus Mariota out there extending plays and made big plays, and that's what killed them at the end of the day. The defense was on the field far too long. They couldn't get off the field, and when the offense went out there, I didn't like the game plan. I thought that uh, running Connor Cook on third and four on the first drive of the series, and, and, and it, like a, it was a quarterback draw. Like, what? You haven't run a quarterback design quarterback draw more than three times all season. You're going to run on the third play in the national semifinal game? I didn't like how the play calling went. Connor was obviously not as, not as good as he uh, has been, but his receivers also let him down. There was about four or five drop balls from Burbridge and Kings that really let him down and stalled which drives. Has, which has happened before. I mean, you which go back and you before. look at the Michigan game. But, so, I mean, defensively, the, the Michigan State, I mean, was, wasn't the Michigan, would you say the Michigan State game plan defensively was to stop Derrick Henry. Right, but and Alabama and Lane Kiffin did a fantastic well, job of exactly understanding it. that, hey, they're going to put eight guys in the box and they're going to try to slow down Derrick Henry. That's okay. We're going to allow them to do that because we're going to think that we can get our speedy wide receivers down the field and challenge the secondary that no other team decided besides Nebraska to do. And they did, and they were successful. Mm -hmm. Michigan State's secondary and defense this year was not up to its typical standards. This was not a very good statistically stout defense. The front four are fantastic. They were. The linebacking core was above average, but the back end was bad. The safeties struggled all year. The corners couldn't, couldn't do the one-on-one -on -one that they typically do. This is the third best Mark D'Antonio team in the last three years, and it just so happens that they got the farthest. Yeah. So where I'm going to wrap up my Michigan State conversation as we transfer to Michigan is if this is the third best team he's had in the last three years and of all the success that they've had, that program is in good shape because they got the furthest with their third best team. We can all agree that Michigan State isn't going anywhere, but I'm not going to sit here and say Michigan State's going to make the college football playoff next year or 2017. I think Michigan State will return to the college football playoff as early as 2018 because that's when the next phase of these young kids will be juniors and seniors and that'll get them back yeah, that's, into that's, the promise. That's a that's a fair. That's where I and I think it'll be I think it'll be a Michigan next year, and I think it'll be Ohio State in 2017, and I think it'll be Michigan State in 2018. You think Michigan's going to go to the college football playoff next year? I have a chance. Really? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I would I would think they would need another it's, year. But that's the that's the beauty of where we live in the in this state and in the Big Ten East Division. It's going to be Michigan State, Michigan, or Ohio State. Every year. Oh, yeah, it's going to be the winner. It's going to be the winner years. of those three yep. every year. This year, Michigan State beat both of those teams on the road. They absolutely deserve to be in the college football playoff. And, yeah, they laid an egg, but they still got there, raised the banner in East Lansing. Everyone will clap, and we'll move on to 2016. You don't think Mark D'Antonio is going to go, oh, well, you would know. They have to, would they have to put up a plaque, though, you know, because it's an open, you know, can you, you can't raise a banner. I wish you guys could see what this guy's doing over here. He's going like this. Well, you can't, you know, you can't raise the banner. You have to, like, put the plaque on the wall. Well. Um, we've, we've got a couple of tweets, a couple sure, of questions. Sure, let's get to a couple of tweets before we One from on. Anthony Allen. I put it out on, uh, on Twitter. If you were a Michigan fan, were you rooting for Michigan State to lose? And uh, Anthony said, nope, whoever wins would have a chance at what we want. I pulled for Michigan and CMU, that's it. Um, a question from Rick. Is it harder to make the football playoffs or a basketball Final Four? That's a good question. Football playoffs because... Um, the totality of 12-game schedule 
or 13 game schedule if you make the Big Ten championship game is much different than look at what Michigan State did last year uh, basketball. I mean, I, I said in February, I think early February. But they were seven seed, right? Yeah. In early February, I said Michigan State had no business even making the tournament. Then well, they go on a run to the final four. Well, and that's that's what it's, happens. It's in, just a different game. There's more people involved. Uh, the, the if six, you lose a game, look at what happened. Everyone still thinks that Ohio State should have been in the in the final four, even after they lost to Michigan State. Everyone, oh, Michigan, and Ohio State should have been there. Look mm-hmm. at what they did in Notre Dame. Well, they, they didn't get in there because the way that the structure is set up, you don't get 68 teams in. Well, and, and if you're you one of four. those. If you're one of those 68, you have a shot. There's always there there's every always, year. There's a and George there's the Mason. C- there's the or Cinderellas there's, of the world. Yep. The Cinderella this year would have been Oklahoma by seed. Probably Michigan State would have been. Uh, I mean by. Well, Michigan uh, State by seed, right? Oh, oh. You're f- I'm just football, saying, if like football. you're going to say the number four seed win it all. Well, Ohio State was number four seed last year. They won it all. Yeah. So getting into the top four in the in the playoff is so much, so much more difficult in. Than getting into well, the in, final four in the basketball. college football playoff top four is in, in in the basketball sense is the one seed in each division. Right. So right. you know that's what uh, another one from Pamika Rose, MSU needs to stop whining and blaming Michigan about not getting the respect they feel they deserve. You played in the semis with the big dogs and didn't rep the Big Ten well at all. The fact is you did well in the conference, but you never blew anyone out, so it shouldn't surprise you. Uh, of the best down you got in Cotton Bowl. I mean, I don't disagree with that. I kind of thought that this Michigan State, again, this is the third best Michigan State team of the past three years. So I'm agreeing with you in the fact that th- this team wasn't blown. Last year, they won every game in the Big Ten Conference by 10 or more points. That's domination. This year, they kind of let some teams hang around that they probably shouldn't have let hang around. And all season long, we kind of figured, like, oh, they'll get, that, they'll get that cleaned up. They'll get their short up. They'll get their short up. And then they didn't. And then they didn't. And then they didn't. And you kind of knew what you had about six games into the season, a good but not great Michigan State team that found ways to win in big games. Whether you want to call it luck, whether you want to call it miracle, beating Michigan propelled them to the, to the next level and gave that team that extra sense of confidence and belief that we can get this done, even if it was on a fluke play or a miracle play however you want to say it. That play changed their season for the better. I, I don't like calling that a fluke play either because it happens. Punters right. fumble punts. A fluke, that, a fluke I say, play I say, is... I say to anyone who says that's a fluke play, I say if that happens in the first quarter, is it still a fluke no, play? No, it's not a fluke play. And I, I would consider a fluke... I, don't, I also don't like that people are calling it the kick six. No. Because the kick six is Auburn, Alabama. No, it's Rangers... Right? Four dash one. Oh, that's right. Dash that's right. Sixty-five. Mi- I don't know. Whatever you had, Mark. Yeah. You know, you asked Mark D'Antonio. Mark D'Antonio right. named it. Uh, switching gears to Michigan. Hey, wow, they they looked very good. Yeah, Florida gave up. Yeah, but that Michigan was... looked great. I mean, it, part of it's because Michigan, Michigan looked showed great up and Florida Michigan gave up. Michigan showed up and Florida didn't. Yeah, and that like Michigan State. So and Alabama. Alabama looked great because Michigan State made them look great, but also because they showed up to play. Michigan showed up to play. Florida didn't show up to play. Michigan got a great win. Look, 10 wins in Jim Harbaugh's first season, beyond expectations for many, beating the SEC runner-up, blowing them out. That's a huge step in the right direction. The fact that he took Jake Rudock, a a cast-off from another Big Ten program, and made him a potential, now he might get drafted. I mean, that's Jim Harbaugh. That's Jim Harbaugh. That's the effect that he's going to have on on kids coming in. Wait until he gets his third-year starter that he groomed from his sophomore season. You know, that's going to be when it gets real scary, when mm-hmm. it gets really good. Um, I loved what they did uh, offensively all season long. I thought that, that more so than them having that really good defense that was ranked, you know, number one in the country at one point this year on defense, their offense was fantastic. They're going to be very, very good in the next few years. I, oh, there's yeah. no doubt in my mind that they're going to be very, very good. Well, and Rudock improved every game. Mm-hmm. He got, you know, it, the his decision of season, making process from the Utah game to the Florida game, it's night and day. It, it, it's two, two different people. And suddenly, you know, at the beginning of the season, he couldn't hit those deep balls. He was overthrowing, mm-hmm. you know, Ju Chesson. Um, but you know, in that Florida game, he had a, he hit a few deep balls. Yep. I mean, can you imagine if that was the Rudock you saw at the beginning of the season? It, we might be talking a different season. Michigan might may have beaten Utah, and no one can predict. I mean, Michigan State outplayed Michigan. I had a conversation with my buddy this weekend. 
we were talking about the just the past games and and he we, he brought up Michigan State and Michigan and I'm like here's the thing people don't realize that Michigan State outplayed Michigan in that game. They did. You know, every they, on, uh, only people people only remember the last play of the game. They don't remember people only remember what they want to remember. Well, and people don't remember that Michigan State doubled the amount of first downs that Michigan had mm -hmm. and you know, I ran the ball better, passed yeah, the ball plenty, better. There's plenty and, of reasons why we're we're going back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Back in time to that. Um, but Michigan did a great job of executing their game plan and playing till the final whistle. Jim Harbaugh is the, the, the best, uh, you know, when the game starts and the lights are on, his mind and his, his competitiveness is, he's the type of guy that, by the way, we need to talk about how well I'm playing in hockey recently. We got to talk about how well Jim Harbaugh's Twitter game has gotten his, again. Because he subtweeted the 49ers so good. Well, and, you know, he's apparently running for president with Wale as vice president. And he's refereeing a Ric Flair. Yeah. And Macho Man Randy or yeah. uh, Hulk Hogan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, WrestleMania. Anyways, when the, when the lights go on and it's time to compete, he will play within the rules until the game is over. He, it doesn't matter if he's winning 100 to nothing or losing 0 to 100. Until the fourth quarter whistle drops, he is going to give you every single ounce of everything he has. And then afterwards, it shuts off for him completely. And he's like, hey, good game. Shake hands. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll play again soon. He's like a little kid in the sense of like when you're out with your, you're playing in the game and you're early, early in the game and before you get so competitive, and for him it's still competitive. Yeah. But before you realize like what's on the line, you just go out and you play your hardest, then you're done and everyone shakes hand after the game. You're like, okay, great. He just, you shut it off after. He would have beat Florida 82 to 14 if he had more time because he doesn't care. There's no taking off the pedal for him. He'll go and he'll go and he'll go and he'll go. I mean, I think at one point when Alabama threw a, another deep ball uh, to Ridley against Michigan State, people started, oh, they're piling it on. Nick Saban's the same way. He's going to play. He ain't going to run the ball. He's not going to feel bad for you that you can't stop his team. You're going to run the ball. You're going to run the ball. You're going to throw the ball. You're going to score points. That's what you're supposed to do in football games. I mean, it, could, it, it might not have been able to get worse for Michigan State. 38 nothing was probably around yeah. the beat down that it was. Because they, they played well in some phases of well, the game. Well, and, and I mean, what? It was only 10 nothing in the first half. 10 game. nothing at halftime. They were a play. I'm telling you, they score that, that touchdown. Connor yeah, Cook doesn't does throw, that, throw pick. that pick. Different game in the third quarter. Anyways, back to, back to back Michigan, to Michigan and, and the perception of Michigan moving forward. Um, they're going to come back. They're going to be really strong again next year. And, and second year, Harbaugh will be probably a little tamer, I would think, as far as like the, the circus that was the first year of Jim Harbaugh was quite the limelight he'll not stay away he'll not shy away from that limelight he'll still do kind of some things but everyone's got the first taste of Jim Harbaugh now so I think everyone can kind of just relax and watch him go to work and instead of fawning over him doing every waking up in the morning and putting his pants on one leg at a time and does he do that does he do I, one leg is at that a time? what he said I think that's what he said but that's why I think it's a little bit you know you said earlier in the show you had talked about how you think Michigan will be the team out of the Big Ten East next year, and you know then Ohio State the year after, and then well, I'm not gonna. I just I don't see with probably a freshman quarterback coming in. I just you know I think it'll probably take a year or two. Let me rephrase that. I think Michigan can be the team to come out of the East next year. I don't necessarily want to say today on January 4th of 2016. I'm gonna screw that up so many times. 2015, 2016. Write your checks. Wrong. Can't redo it. Um, I don't necessarily think that they will be right today. If you're asking me today who's winning the Big Ten East, I'm going, I don't have a clue. Tell me who the quarterback is for Michigan. Tell me who the quarterback is for Michigan State. Tell me who the quarterback is for Ohio State. Tell me the quarterback for Penn State because all four of those teams are breaking in new quarterbacks next year. Well, and the winner of the Big Ten East also isn't guaranteed to go to the college football playoff. Iowa's going to be the best team in the Big Ten next year. They don't lose anybody from a team that went almost undefeated now, they looked bad in the Rose Bowl no, game. they looked really but bad. But they're going to have all, everybody back, a wealth of experience, and they're going to be the team to beat in the Big Ten, I think, overall. So I just think that, 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 that Michigan, Michigan State and Ohio State every year is going to be just the thing to watch in the northern half of our country football-wise. Those three teams – Will be will be fantastic. Well, doesn't the Big Ten go up and add another Big Ten game next year too? Yes, they're it? playing a nine-game schedule yeah. starting next year. So I mean, you're looking at Michigan State's going to play, or Michigan will play Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. Yeah, but um, where? 
Some of those are on the road. So Michigan State will be on the road. Ohio State will be on the road because those are both home games. And they're year. at Penn State too, right? They're, they might be home against Penn State. They were at Penn State this year. Oh, that's Remember, right. Remember, that was a Are they day game. Uh, going to Iowa next year? Uh, uh, do they have the schedule out? Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the schedules are out. Let me see here. I do believe that Michigan's schedule next year is very difficult. Hawaii on September 3rd, UCF, Colorado, an early Penn State game, uh, the fourth week of the season. They play Wisconsin last this year. Next year, they didn't play Wisconsin. At home or um, at home? Yes. Okay. They play Iowa in Kinnick. Okay. Indiana, you know Indiana. I mean, you know Indiana's a good team. They, I don't know mm-hmm. if they'll be a good team next year, but yeah. So Ohio they go on, the, on the, road the road to Iowa, Michigan State, and Ohio State. And uh, don't worry well, about Maryland or Rutgers Indiana. or, yeah, <laughs> or <Mark> Rutgers. Rutgers. <laughs> they play Minnesota again. <laughs> Uh, no, no, they miss no them. Minnesota next year. They'll oh, be that's the, that's the whole Big Ten crossover. That I think that Michigan has a really good chance of, of doing some special things. Um, look, they don't leave the state, if I'm not mistaken. They don't leave the home for the first five games. Yep. They, uh, yeah, they're gonna, and they're then gonna, their first road game is at Rutgers. Okay, they so they're going to be they're gonna be 6-0. and oh. Is that Indiana, or who's the one right after uh, the bye? Illinois home. Okay, so they're going to be 7-0 and oh in Michigan State then when they go to East Lansing. It, if... They don't stub their own toe. Michigan State, well, they Michigan could be. State's season next year predicates on the third week of the season when they go to Notre Dame. Yep. Because that'll be a young team. They'll still be breaking themselves in, breaking in a new quarterback. And if they can win that game, entering, uh, you know, one more non-conference game and then Big Ten season, they could potentially be uh, 7-0. and yeah. 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 Uh, Furman. It's a good Furman. One. Yeah. Tough, tough one. Open date. Uh, Notre Dame, Wisconsin, at Indiana, home against BYU, home against Northwestern, and at Maryland, where they host the Michigan Wolverines. Yeah, I, so I see, I see them. I see them. You know, if they can get by that Notre Dame game, they can potentially be seven and zero. I mean, Wisconsin will be tough next year. Don't don't let anybody fool you for both teams. And North Michigan West, and Michigan Northwestern State. can always be a tough. Northwestern's game. a tough out most years, um, but. I, I, it, today it's too early to talk about that far into the future um, because it's, it's just it's it's so it's fun. I'm having so much fun talking about this with you guys, honestly. Uh, if you guys want to get more calls in, we'll take another couple calls. 248-356-0077. This has got to be the best time to be a fan of Michigan or Michigan State because the rivalry's back. It means a whole heck of a lot to both sides. And everybody is on a side. You can't be neutral in the middle of this thing. It's and that's what's really beautiful about it. Because we're playing, we're talking, we're not talking about Big Ten championships so much as we are talking college football playoff berths anymore between these which, two teams. Which I mean, well, Big Ten championship you have to will get. Be a, yeah. Will be you a, have Big, Ten to get the Big Ten championship will be to a thing to get you into the college football playoff. And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm stoked about it. I think it's fun. It's fun to have banter with people about it. It's fun to, um, you know. Let it's, people have their opinions and things on both teams. Because I just got another tweet in here that's uh, from uh, Garius, lifelong Michigan fan, went to Michigan Law School, graduated from there. I went. I wanted MSU to win, and I'm a little sad they got smoked. I'm not. Well, I know you're not. But this guy has, a, you know, a has gra- a heart. He had, well, no, he has a law degree from Michigan, so he's smart. Oh, oh, he's yeah. I see him. It's it's going to be a much anticipated two hundred plus days. Oh yeah, and that's the thing I hate about college football. It's just like you know, you you start at the end of August, you're done beginning of January, and then and I you know I love college football more than pro football, but you, then you're done for nine months or about nine months. You know, it's it's going to be a long two hundred plus days for these. Not long. It's just it'll, it'll be long, but it'll be much anticipated. There's going to be a lot of talk. You know, especially once, you know, you find out who's starting for Michigan, you find out who's, I mean, what, it'll be Tyler O'Connor probably for Michigan State. You yes. Think? All right, we're going to shift gears. It's now 1 o'clock. Uh, nice half-hour chat about Michigan, Michigan State. Get those tweets in, those comments, questions, anything like that. We'll still get back to them. But now I want to shift gears uh, to the Lions. Do we have anything out of uh, Allen Park right now yet? Do let you me, see anything? Uh, let me take a peek. Do you see anything crazy before I go into my... I, uh, I did see uh, before, right when we started the show, that uh, 
Jim Caldwell will not reveal if he's met with Martha Ford. That's not surprising. Does Jim Caldwell really reveal anything? No, but it's the last one of the seasons, so... Uh, Jim Caldwell said it's difficult to find someone playing as well as Matthew Stafford has been playing. Okay. And this, so, uh, you know, here's my thing with that. Uh, Brad Galley, the sports anchor here at uh, WXYZ, a good friend of both of ours, tweeted out yesterday, the second half Lions team is 67,528 times more fun to watch than the team that showed up in the first half of the season. Mm -hmm. To which I tweeted back, yes, but, and I haven't updated the statistics yet, uh, yes, but where is it? They're also playing teams with a combined forty-six and fifty-nine record. Okay, here here's the only tweet I need to see from the Lions press conference right now. Paul Paschke, Lions Jim Caldwell doesn't sound like a coach on his way out the door. Uh, is anyone surprised though? Ashley one? Scobie from uh, ninety-seven-one Ticket says absolutely not, and that doesn't. I mean, it should surprise some people, whatever. But uh, but at the same time. Rico brought up on the Suburban Ford 7 Sports Cave yesterday. I mean, the Lions haven't fired a winning coach ever. <laughs> Why would they fire their 18 and 14 head coach after two years? One of them, they made the playoffs. One of them, they took a step back, but really were just two games away from making the playoffs. If they don't lose that Hail Mary game and if they maybe figure out a way to beat one of those, if they beat Seattle, or, wait, if Calvin if doesn't fumble on the goal line, no, Forget no, the batted ball. No, you got to count the batted ball. But if he doesn't fumble, okay, if he doesn't fumble, yeah. Then there's no batted ball. But if the bat, if they call the batted ball, they get the ball back. We're having fumbled anyways. So the balls didn't break their way this year. But you know what? Think about last year when they went 11 and five. The breaks went their way. Every yeah. bounce went their way. They went to uh, but I think London you can say that and fell behind season. by like 30 points and came back and won that game. They, they had so many comeback victories, and the ball just bounced their way this year. Sometimes the ball doesn't bounce your way. The ball bounced against Seattle for most of the first half of their season. Now they're in the playoffs because the ball started bouncing back their way. Well, so here's a question I posed to, uh, again, my buddy this weekend. What, uh, it, you know, if, if the Lions win that game against Seattle and okay. then they win that, well, it would have been after the fact, but is our Jim or uh, our Martin Mayhew and – and Tom Lewan still with his team? Uh, nah. uh, yeah, I would say they are. Nah. I would say that, I mean, so would you take the season the Lions had knowing that you're getting rid of Martin Mayhew, you're getting rid of Tom Lewan, and then hopefully bringing in a new GM? I'm not super confident that they're going to bring in somebody new. I, I, you know, I would put it like 60-40 that Sheldon White comes back next year. But hmm. All right, well, here is uh, what I want to get into next. Um, last night I had a... Uh, uh, a tweet that went out. I sent it out. Um, yeah, I missed this. And I wanted to clarify everything so that everyone, you know, because of course Twitter is a, a fun place to be most of the time. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> and uh, let's just start from the, the from the beginning. So last night I'm, I'm watching uh, How to Make a Murderer, uh, the new wet Netflix series. Have you heard two, about this? Two episodes in. Oh, it's fantastic yeah. stuff. That's it's what the I've best heard. theater. If you haven't started watching that show, get on it. Uh, I'm just I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I have like five minutes left in episode four. I had to leave for hockey last night, so I couldn't finish it. But anyways, regardless, so I get an email. And I will be completely candid with this uh, just simply because I want to clear the air and I want to make sure that you know everyone is understanding of why I did what I did and how I feel about why I did it because I don't think I did anything wrong um, by saying what I said uh, last night. So here we go. So I got an email from uh, Jeff Skaversky. Jeff Skaversky is the ABC sports reporter in Philadelphia. So this is a guy not unlike myself who, when you get tips and you get things from other people, sometimes you have to filter through what is what and what is not because sometimes you get tips from people that you don't necessarily trust and mm -hmm. then you get tips from people you do trust. So Jeff got a tip from somebody that he trusts and it says, this is exactly what it says, Hey, it's Jeff from ABC in Philly. This may be a long shot, but there's a chance Chip Kelly is heading to Detroit to interview for the Lions job tonight. I'm told he is flying into Oakland County International, landing around 1045. I don't have time to double check this info, and I'm not 100% sure if it's accurate, but if you have a free camera, it would be a good get. He has not talked since he was fired. So I sent back a follow-up email. Hey, thanks so much for... Uh, for reaching out to me. Uh, I'll let everybody who's working, I was not working last night, know that. Um, let me know if you follow up, how confident are you in your source? 
and he responded responded back to that. He goes, as I said in the previous email, got a tip, don't have more time to get info at the moment. So all I was doing in this tweet, now we get to the tweet. So I get that information and I sit there and I think to myself, okay, I want to share this information with the people out there because A, it's interesting information, it's not a confirmed report, but it is something to get people to think and to, to talk about what they would like to do if this was the case it was. I'm not trying to break any news. I didn't break any confer confirmed facts and I didn't certainly say anybody was out or anybody was in. I said this, just got word from a source in Philly that Chip Kelly is asterisk potentially flying into Detroit tonight for a asterisk potential interview with the Lions. It's double potential there? Two potentials. No confirms. Now, we do find out today, this morning I get an email from the Lions, everyone gets an email from the Lions that says, Jim Caldwell will, uh, will address the media at 12.30, followed by the players in the locker room shortly thereafter. Meaning... Which is usually how it works, right? But today's Black Monday. That's and true. And this is the day yeah. that they were going to fire him. They had have fired him already. And they would have not let him go in front of the media and say anything else. Mm -hmm. So he's staying. He's here. He's not, he's not going anywhere. So, my... He's, stay, he's staying for now. If for they now. bring in a new GM, right, and yeah, right. yeah, he's staying but for now. For now, my tip for today could still be true. Chip Kelly still could have been here. We don't know that. I'm assuming it didn't happen. But my tip was, was off. Nobody loses anything. We can all wipe our hands and it, we can it, all move forward. It was a tip. That's it was a it tip, was. and that's all I with, expressed to with people. With two potentials, you never said he's coming to Detroit. The best part about this is the people's reaction. Oh, I'm sure. It because not, no one was angry. No one, no one was outwardly angry at me or like you're, you don't know what you're talking about or anything like that. Because everyone saw the potentials and all the websites that did pick it up and put it out there also said, yeah, this is an unconfirmed report, unconfirmed report. Mm -hmm. So clearing the air there, I just wanted to make sure I don't want to be a person that's just trying to like break some news because I want to get a lot of Twitter followers. Yeah. Like, no, that's not what happened. I felt like sharing. And if, if people don't want that, then I, may, you know, I won't share anything anymore. I want to get up. I think no, you should keep sharing. No, well, you guys stay on Twitter. The so best, the, <laughs> the best ones were like, um, you know, quote tweets with like the Michael Scott from uh, from the office. No, 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 and like everyone was like all the big capital N O N O N O N O N O N O N, and like if if I think somebody said they were gonna burn down Ford Field if that happened, you know, another guy. I mean, it's not funny. That's uh, funny to joke about, but it is funny in the sense that you know the reactions were livid. Yet, uh, but so here's, yeah, here's yeah, people my, don't want, and, and, and I guess some people's also remarks were, well, they got to have a GM first if they're going to hire a new head coach. And I wanted well, to say, what if Sheldon White's the, what if Sheldon the, White's the general manager? <laughs> they just haven't announced it yet. Because that you would don't be know the that. Lions move, right? Or what if Chip Kelly's going to come here and be the general manager and head coach? <laughs> Last night, really you don't know these things, the but, it is all, but, but these are all things to think about. So you can't sit here and, and, and really say, like, oh, this guy made this up out of left field. And like I said, nobody said that. But I just thought it was really interesting in the fact that, you know, people were like, well, they need a GM first. Well, yeah, they need a GM. What was Chip Kelly just? A GM and a head coach. In the same place. Justin Rogers just tweeted out, I just received a well-written email from someone applying for the Lions GM job. It was not Elliot Wolf. <laughs> um, but, I mean, going back to the Chip Kelly thing, I mean, wouldn't it just be like the Lions move, though, to bring in Chip Kelly? Well, and that was a lot of the pe what a lot of the people had. Uh, it's just, like, that's it. It's it was kind of interesting. Lions. Hashtag Lions. Yeah, that's a, it. a lot of people were very, very, <laughs> very funny on that, saying that would be the most Lions thing to do, to bring in a coach who basically buried a franchise. I mean, he traded out all their talent for the guys that he deemed fit for his system. And now they're kind of stuck there with what a hodgepodge group of guys. We're going to talk Chip Kelly. What if Chip Kelly goes to the Tennessee Titans? Where, Chip Kelly uh, is going to go. I mean, you if, know, Marcus Mariota is your quarterback. If you're asking me yesterday, before this information comes to me, I'm going. Oh, he's going before to Tennessee. You, yeah. Why wouldn't he want to go to Tennessee? He's got a guy that he recruited to come to his college and left before he really got a chance to get his hands on him. In Marcus Mariota. He does everything right, and that franchise is begging for relevance. And what they got the they have first pick again? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Begging for relevance in the NFL. I mean, Tennessee Titans aren't exactly. I think Oregon would take him back in a heartbeat too. 
No, I think Oregon's happy with where they're at. Really? You think? So? And Chip has said he Mark? doesn't want to go back to the college game. He wants to stay in the NFL. You think Saban takes an NFL no. job? You don't think so? No. One last shot, because he doesn't have any shots left. He has. He either stays I, in I, Alabama I, or he I takes an NFL he's, shot. He's already got a statue in front of the building. <laughs> he's Alabama. already got his house paid off why by in, the why boosters. Why the heck are you leaving? Why are you leaving a place where they got a statue of you in front of the building? I, I don't think you'd go anywhere. Yeah. Um, but anyways, so I'm glad that I had a chance to, to clear the air. Seth, I saw you peering your head around the corner there. You were... I'm from Philadelphia. Ah! Oh, that's right. Yes. Flip, flip, flip Philadelphia. You know where that's from? Is that from It's Always Sunny? Yes, it is. Yeah. You remember Flip Philadelphia, don't you, Seth? You don't watch It's Always Sunny? No, I don't. I've just started oh. re-watching It's Always Sunny. Oh, it's great. Because I started watching Making a Murderer, and I was kind of watching it while playing video games. So, so I, it's a show good. you need to focus on. But I can watch so It's Always good. Sunny while playing video games. So good. Um, to that point, I guess it's, it's fun. Now that we have pretty much, for the time being, and here, let, me, let me put this this way before I ask the question. Terrell Austin, defensive coordinator for the Lions, likely interviewing. I think I saw today he's interviewing for at least two jobs. Two jobs. One one's Browns. in Miami and one's the Browns. I think those are the two interviews he's going to get. Um, and then this guy, offensive coordinator from Chicago, Strauss, Strauss, whatever his name is, apparently he's also getting interviews for head coaching jobs. If he gets a head coaching job, he may pry Jim Bob Cooter away because supposedly those two guys are boys. Um, Darryl, Terrell Austin, if he leaves and Jim Bob Cooter leaves, that will be then the question whether or not the new general, man, general manager, Sheldon White, would don't, don't want to keep Jim Caldwell and have to find two new coordinators. That's kind of where this whole thing lies as we sit here today because while the staff has shown over the last eight games that they can win football games, the offense is playing much better. Matthew Stafford has been much better. The defense is playing much better, allowing less points keeping them in games. If those two leave and you have Jim Caldwell left, do you really want him here still, knowing I mean, his game management? Would Jim Caldwell take over play calling, though? I mean, oh, man, that would be terrible. You think so? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you're kind oh, yeah, of, I don't yeah, want that. <laughs> no. But doesn't that, I mean, if you don't want him taking over play calling, would you want him as a head coach? Head coaches are they're different. Yeah, but his game management is terrible. That's what his I'm. Time that's why I, I, I agree. I agree. I'm agreeing with all of these things. That's what head coaches do, though. Head coaches don't necessarily call a lot of plays. They don't really veto a lot of plays either. If there's something that's completely against, like if well, Terrell lost or if uh, Jim Bob Cooter was like, "All right, triple reverse to Matthew Stafford," I'm assuming that that Caldwell would be like, "No, call something else." That that would be the only time a. Uh, you know, a head coach really is going to get too involved with the, the offensive game plan. I mean, he can suggest, hey, let's try to run the ball a little bit more on this drive. Hey, I'm seeing, right now, I'm seeing that this is opening up a little bit. Let's try these things. He is more telling, he's got con uh, control panel in front of him and, you know, telling the coaches, okay, you know, I want you to start doing a little bit more of this. Okay, I got to look at the defense. I got to look at the special teams. How's our injuries? How's our health? What's the referee calling? He's got his head so many different places that Jim Bob Cooter, the only thing he's caring about is what the defense has given him, and he's calling plays to try to exploit that. Same thing on the other side. Terrell Austin doesn't care about what Jim Bob Cooter and the offense is doing. He's trying to figure out what the opposing offense is trying to do so he can stop it. So Jim Caldwell's in the middle trying to, to juggle all these you know, balls at the same time. That's why head coaching is much more difficult and much more to have good head coaches is you know, to keep everything in line because everything's happening. Quick, 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 Brad, quick, 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 quick. Uh, Brad Galley, we mentioned him earlier, just sent me his story out of Allen Park to post. And, uh, you know, his first line is Jim Caldwell didn't say much at a season-ending press conference on Monday. His headline is Lions head coach Jim Caldwell sounds like a man who will keep his job. Uh, a couple quotes in here. The perception of Caldwell keeping his job as Lions head coach is growing, especially after Detroit's 6-2 and two finish to the season. Quote, I think the record's the record. It's what, it's what, it is what it is, he said on Monday. Um, he's still working, still under contract, and we'll do what we do. He is 18-14 and 14 in, in uh, two seasons with the Lions. That might be the best start a Lions coach has had in a while. That's what I said. You should just listen to me more often next week. I'm sorry, Brad. That's why they can't fire. That's why they can't fire him. Well, no, I don't think they will fire. I, ne I never thought they would fire him. 
Well, I mean, after one and seven, everyone thought he was going to get fired. No, because I kind of saw. I mean, we, we had on the show though. I said I didn't want him to get fired. The only reason he gets fired is if the new GM brings in his own guy. Well, that's part of that's part of the whole process that we're going to have to see play out here over the next couple of weeks because we'll know relatively soon if uh, Austin Stan or if Jim Bob Cooter is going to be Stan or not. Those are two of the. The, the coaching tree, you lose two of the foundations. The head coach is the only one left. I don't know if that's the guy you want to keep. Yeah. I, I really do hope that they go out and they get a different um, general manager. No disrespect at all to Sheldon White. None. I have, it's, it's just time to have fresh eyes on this. I mean, Sheldon's worked for the Lions for 15, well, 20 years. Well, it's the same so, thing as bringing Martin Mayhew. So, so just, 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 just say thank you. Here's a nice, cushy front office job. We don't want to fire you. You're the interim. That doesn't mean he loses his job or his employment status with the Lions. It's just, hey, we're going in another direction. The franchise needs some fresh blood in here. No disrespect, but you didn't. I mean, what did Sheldon White do besides pick up a couple of you know scraggly waiver wire pickups? I mean, it, it's, it, don't put him in charge of this year's draft class. Get somebody in here who's going to have a better shot at that than Sheldon White is. That's all I'm saying. It's not, not, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And Sheldon might do a good job, but it, it's, it's time to change the ideas and the radical nature of how the Lions do things is to always promote from within when it has consistently failed you. I'm simply suggesting that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing multiple times and expecting different results. Do something different. Change it up. Shake it up. No disrespect to Sheldon. Just be like, look, timing's not working in your favor here, bud. The t previous three times we've done this, it's failed. You're out. You're still here. Like I said, go back to what he was doing before. Assistant too. Yeah, we're not getting Make him rid the main of you. assistant so he can still be a part of it. But I just feel like the guy who's making the sh final call at the end of the day needs to be somebody outside the organization with a fresh take, who has good NFL ties, who can evaluate talent and get the right people here. Because if the coaching, if, if the ownership feels the coaching staff is good enough which in place, then right now the only other thing that you need to focus on is getting better talent. The Lions are limited by their talent, and they're losing some guys. They're going to lose a lot of guys this year. Yeah. So you got to get good talent to come to Detroit. Make Detroit a destination, and you can do that with a flashy big-name general manager or a guy who's well-respected inside the NFL. Because if you just do it with Sheldon White, all the free agents out there going, who? Not that they have much direct, you know. But, but make, make your, you have an opportunity here. You've already taken the first couple of steps of changing how you do things around here. Continue those steps. Keep the change going. Don't stop now. And if you want to keep Jim Caldwell and his staff, you're, you're at peace with that, fine. But I bet you Jim Caldwell and his staff are going, I'm glad that you've decided to keep me here. Get me some players. I can't do this on my own. But, uh, you know, I mean, they've got to restructure the contract with Calvin Johnson to get some players. I think they trade Calvin Johnson. Well, yeah, no, that, well, and. Uh, said well, the let's, same thing. I was, let's I was, bring it up. I mean, should they trade Calvin Johnson? I think they should. They should try to trade Calvin Johnson. I was, I was talking to somebody yesterday um, about what happened with Ndamukin Sue and how the Lions were left empty-handed kind of the, you know, the prom queen at the door, like, hey, you're gone? We didn't get anything for you? Same thing will happen with Calvin Johnson. If they don't trade him, I think that he may look elsewhere next year after his free agent deal starts up. I mean, his contract ends. If they don't re-sign him, then he's going to leave after. It's just like Ndamukong Sue. Because the Lions felt that, they go, oh, we'll let him play through his contract year. We'll sign him at the end with, along with other people. Well, if they don't do that with Calvin, if this thing drags on and they don't extend him or restructure his contract, Calvin Johnson's leaving Detroit. Don't, don't kid yourself. It's the same thing with Dominick and Sue. Because somebody out there is going to go, ooh, 32-year-old receiver? Yeah, that's pretty old. But like Randy Moss did late in his career. Some of the other big receivers I, did. My thing with that is just, I mean, he's been beat up so much. Yeah, but I mean, he, what's, so he you gotta get first? you gotta get something for him. No, no, I'm a, I'm like, agreeing with you. What, what what do you? Just he's been beat up, but so you mean well, no one wants him? That's why you need to get rid of him because he's oh, not the yeah, same yeah, receiver yeah. he used to be. You know, it, and what this year he played 16 games for the first time in three years. Yeah. Since 2012, that says something right there. And part, you know, 
the reason he's so beat up is because he catches balls where he's in such a vulnerable position where he's getting hit low and his knees getting hurt and you know he's 32 yeah which a is super old for a wide receiver but i don't think he can come back like randy johnson did or randy moss did randy johnson is a pitcher and, yeah, and that's why you do. I think you do need to trade him. What's his cap hit? Close to twenty something million dollars this year. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot, and and that's what happened when you gave him these massive contracts and you n- invested so much money into Calvin Johnson, Matthew Stafford, and Dominican Sue is you couldn't really pay anybody else anything. Well, and you've got to so, resign. You've got to resign Ziggy Ounce at some point. Ziggy. That guy's the best player on on our defense. Ziggy. I would put him ahead of DeAndre Levy. Ziggy and, and DeAndre are going to be staples of your defense. Well, you got to get Levy, Darius. Let me sign for a while. Yeah, Darius Slay will be your another one that in a couple of years. You're going to have to re-sign him. He's showing that he's got some skill. And Ziggy's but you got to go out. You got to do what you did with Golden Tate. You got to find guys like Golden Tate that have experience and talent that they've shown it somewhere else, and you're bringing them in here and you're having them be structures of your team. That's where I want them to go out and find another linebacker. I like like to hear Whitehead, by the way. But I want them to go find out another defensive lineman. Haloti not is probably done. It, it, you know, I, I don't know if he plays again. If, if he does, I don't know if he plays here. I think he might go back to Baltimore. They'll probably resign him and then re- let him retire as a Raven. I, uh, I put it out on Twitter asking people if the Lions should trade Calvin Johnson. Jason Vickers said no one will take his contract, bud. Well, that's not what I asked. I asked would you trade Calvin Johnson. It's not about, you know, you could find someone to take his contract or if he made it beneficial enough and then Brendan uh, Brendan Schroeder said the Lions should not trade Calvin Johnson half of this quote down season was in Lombardi system he is still a top three NFL receiver disagree with that totally I would put him in the top 10 well, he I faded, he faded in away five. in three games straight fantasy football owners will let you know yeah he had two catches for 40 yards in two games or something like that I mean he did not have the type of season that you know you're gonna think that he's like Odell Beckham Jr. You know, he's not. There's, there's up-and-coming receivers in the league, and there will continue to be so. Calvin is a good number one ride receiver, but he's probably a better complimentary guy alongside one of these young studs. That's exactly So if you can it. get him in a system, like the Giants. Think about that. Think if you had Calvin on one side and Odell Beckham Jr. on the other. You want to know who's making bank for being the old man? Anquan Bolden. I mean, here, let's just, let's just look at his stats. And Anquan Bolden, by the way, great fantasy. You know, you need next year low-round pick. But he's a starting wide receiver who's the number two. So in 2011, Calvin Johnson played in 16 games, had 1,600 yards, 16 touchdowns. Arguably his best. That was his best season. He had, you know, and then 2012, he broke the record with 1,900 yards, but only had five touchdowns. Uh, played 16 games. 2013, only played 14 games, had 1,400 yards. And 12 touchdowns last season, 13 games, 1177 or 1077 yards and eight touchdowns. This year, he played a full season, 1200 yards, nine touchdowns. I mean, he's he's going down. And then uh, you know, as Brendan said, he would he's a top three wide receiver. I just I disagree. Lynn tweeted at us, no way. Keep hashtag Megatron. You know, you I look think, at I Calvin he... Johnson stat wise and, and yards wise is the number 10 receiver in the NFL. Talking, talking to Calvin, he, I think he wants to be in Detroit and retire a line. And he's, he did admit that playing your whole career in one place but is, that's is, why is, is, is an accomplishment. If a team wants to keep you around that long, that's a good thing. However, Calvin's a competitor. Calvin wants to win. And if this team doesn't do the things necessary, I think this is a huge – this is another reason why I think they need to go out and hire a GM who's got no ties to the franchise. Calvin's been through it ice now he's been through this and if they keep Sheldon White I think Calvin rolls his eyes and goes nothing's changing here nothing's going to be any different I'm not resigning owe me the money you owe me I'll play next year and then I'm gone this is an opportunity for the Lions to make a state and a claim to the people on their roster and elsewhere in the NFL we're going to win we want to win and Martha Ford is as serious about winning as she says she is then these are opportunities for them to do things that make statements, even if it doesn't work out, even if it falls flat, even if they go out and hire some GM and he's worse than anyone we've ever had before. You're still making the claim, we're trying something new, we're doing something different. Same old Lions isn't working, and that's what would happen if they kept Sheldon White. Well, and, but they might be. Well, and, and you know they have Ernie Corsi who is helping guide the GM search which would be nice if, you know, he had the final call because I don't think he would pick Sheldon White. But in the end, it is Martha Ford that has the final call. And, I think and Rod Wood. I think that she'll listen. I do. I do. 
But do you, I, she could listen, but I, you know, again, it just goes back. They're so loyal. The Fords have they're always loyal been loyal. Fault. That's what I'm saying. So, you know, they're loyal to Sheldon White. You know, it's great. Ernie Corsi, thank you for bringing in all these great GM candidates. And, you know, we're just, we're going to stay with Sheldon White right now. We think he's the best option. He's been with us forever. I, I could totally see that happening. Yep. Yep. All right. A couple minutes left here. Going to wrap things up. Um, we are actually taking a, a hiatus next Monday due to the oh, auto yes. show. I meant to bring that uh, up. Auto show starts next week, media day. So we'll be doing a ton of really cool features from down at Cobo Hall. Yeah, we've got, um, we've got a live stream from, how long is our live stream, Seth? What, 6.50 in the morning until? It's all day, all day. wall to wall stuff. I, I'll probably pop down there. Car at some reveals point with uh, with a, with a racer. I got to get in touch with uh, our boy Merrill, Merrill oh, Kane, yeah. who we does a great Merrill job Kane. with the Detroit Grand Prix. Uh, some of those drivers, those Indy drivers. And, I'm excited um, for the Grand Prix. I mean, we're six it's months good, away. Man. Yeah, I know. You know me. I'm good. a racing fan. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So next week we will not be here doing the show, but the following Monday we'll be back. Uh, I will be joined by Adam Straczynski from Detroit Sports Podcast once again. We'll continue to dive into uh, just all the stuff. We can finally switch gears to college basketball, so I urge you tonight, part 6 of the, o'clock. Part of the Big Ten season. Part we'll of the Big Ten season. From now. John Beeline and I just spoke earlier this morning, uh, talked about what Michigan did during the uh, – the Michigan basketball team did during the football game. You won't want to miss his answer to that. It's a pretty good one. And uh, we'll, we'll hear from more from him as the time goes on. But Red thanks Wings. as always. Yeah, talk Red Wings. Well, you know, we'll talk Red Wings. We'll get the Red Wings back in here. Just a little bit. People don't like to talk about the Red Wings. <laughs> Yeah, but, uh, you know, just a little Some bit. Some great features coming up in the next couple of weeks. We appreciate you guys, as always, tuning in uh, to all of our platforms here at WXYZ. Uh, have a great, what is it, Monday? Monday. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to still get the used to this. The great start to 2016. 2016, baby. Maxwell, as always, thanks for your input. Thanks, Seth, sir. thanks for running the board. See you guys all have a great day.